Welcome, folks. We're going to give it a minute for admin to let everybody in from the waiting room. Welcome. Good evening. Evening, everybody. Welcome, folks. We are going to be getting started in one few minutes, just getting a few more people in from the waiting room. Thanks for joining us tonight. We've got a, a good crowd, comparatively. So this is the first time we've tried to do this uh, remotely in a virtual setting. Okay. It is 635 and we still have people coming in, but we will let, we will let them in as they come and we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the first uh, Baltimore County House and Senate delegation virtual town hall. Uh, so what, uh, for the folks that have joined us before, uh, we started doing uh, town halls to hear from our constituents, hear from members from around the county and citizens about their concerns related to the legislative session uh, two years ago. Uh, been very successful. Um, we, last first year, we ended up meeting over at the school board um, and then had to uh, expand and meet over at the uh, state fair grounds. We had so many people participate. And now being safe and staying um, within restrictions for the state and recommendations from the federal government. We wanted to make sure that we continue to give you all a forum to engage with us, let us know what your concerns are, and have us an opportunity to, one, engage with you, you know, as we go into the legislative session. Uh, so I will, uh, this is the first time, as I mentioned before, that we've tried to do this. Um, we're using our uh, Zoom account, so we have all of the members from, that are able to attend from the House and from the Senate. I sent out the invite for folks and asked you to register. And then there was the Zoom link. And then it said, if you have any questions, send them directly to us. So in the past, we used a Google form and some folks registered. We had about 166 people say they were going to participate. Uh, I'd love to see all those folks on tonight. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. I know that not 166 people are interested in speaking. And then we sent out a re an update asking for those who registered but wanted to speak to let us know so we could make sure that we have a list of those folks. So we have about 25 people that let us know in ahead, of, ahead of time that they wanted to speak. I'm sure there may be more than that. If there are, I'm just going to, we're going to go through the list that we have um, in no particular order, just the folks that responded and that we had that we knew were going to speak or wanted to say something. And we're going to go through that once we've exhausted that list. We'll open it up if there are members or folks, if there are participants that we didn't call on that wanted to speak, Raise your hand, put it in the chat. We'll have staff monitoring it while this is going on and we'll add it to the list. And then after those 23 to 25 people have gone, we'll then keep asking folks. Now, I think we had on the schedule, we were gonna speak and be in here for an hour. I'm letting you all know that under the circumstances, happy to stay on and take concerns. Um, and I know some of my members feel the same way. So while we're gonna try and stick to an hour and get everybody in, 
if we have more people that are interested in speaking, we'll keep rolling and let folks have their voices heard and their uh, concerns presented to the delegation. Uh, I'll also say we're sticking as normal to a three minute, um, strict three minutes per person. Uh, if you have questions, we'll make sure we write them down. I'll open it up to the membership uh, if they have, if somebody wants to address the question. If not, we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, so it's an opportunity for you to voice your concern, present your issue. You can ask a question. Um, I'll open it up for folks to address it or answer a question. If not, we'll move on to the next person uh, and feel free to contact us after, um, after this is done with any other particular questions or if you want to continue to engage with the delegation uh, and its members. Uh, with that, I would like to pass it to my vice chair, Delegate Ben Brooks from District 10. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd like to say a good evening. Welcome to everyone as well. You know, and uh, you know, this, uh, this being the time of year that the whole world is sincere, and this is demonstrated by our, our, our kind deeds, our kind words, and our kindness, you know. So hopefully we'll provide a platform for you tonight so you can ask whatever questions that you want, and perhaps we can get them all answered. So here again, welcome to everyone. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Delegate. And we are always excited and happy to have our speaker, Speaker Adrian Jones from District 10. Uh, we'll open it up for you to make some remarks before we start. And I see we have about 100 people on the call now, which is great. And I'm going to be very brief only to say when we go into session um, next month, it will be different as it relates to this pandemic. But one key thing that um, that we will be doing in the House, if you uh, want to meet with your House member, um, you can do that by appointment. And, and that is allowed, although the State House is closed, but the office building is. So I think that has been um, a question some of the people have been asking. Um, but you still would have to do, um, make sure you, you uh, you know, wear the mask, et cetera. But um, just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware that you can meet individually with, by appointment with your house members. And, and the hearings will be uh, all virtual. So let's get going. Excellent. That I'm gonna quick introductions for the members so the folks that are participating know who we have here. Uh, and this is in no particular order, just how I see folks um, on my screen. Delegate Metzger, if you'd like to introduce yourself, district, and committee you're on. He's muted. Rick, go ahead and unmute <laughs> yourself. <laughs> what? There you go. There you go. What a joy it is, ladies and gentlemen, to, to be with everyone, uh, at least seeing you in, in uh, not physical person, but in virtual person. Y'all look good, you look healthy, and that's the good thing, uh, including Dr. Ebersol. He even always looks excellent. So I just wanted to point that out to him. It's a joy, Michelle, everybody. I'm looking forward to seeing in the, in the chambers and in the house, and we'll do the best we can with what we're working with. Delegate Guyton. Thank you so much. Thank you for... Uh, putting this together, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for being here with us tonight. Um, I am so appreciative of all of my constituents are here. I represent those of you who are North Towson, Parkville, Ridge Ruxton, and all the way up 83 to Pennsylvania. So if that's your area, please contact me if you have any needs. Remember to continue to support each other, support your neighbors, and uh, stay safe. Delegate Ruth. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, uh, my name is Sheila Ruth. I represent District 44B, West Baltimore County. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here with everybody. Um, look forward to hearing your comments and your questions. And I'm on the Environment and Transportation Committee. Delegate Ebersole. Sometimes the space bar works. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Eric Ebersole. I uh, represent uh, District 12, which is Southwest Baltimore County, Catonsville, Arbutus, Lansdowne, Baltimore Highlands, Riverview, and Halethorpe. 
Uh, I serve on the Ways and Means Committee. I am chair of the Early Childhood Committee. I also have the distinction and pleasure of being an assistant majority whip. Thank you. Delegate Bill Castro. Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Bell Castro. I proudly represent District 11. Um, thank you very much for being here tonight, and I look forward to hearing from you. My senator from District 44, Senator Charles Sidnor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as I brought greetings to my uh, colleagues, I uh, just want to say uh, happy Hanukkah for those of you who celebrate. Merry Christmas. An early Merry Christmas to those of you who will be celebrating. I am uh, Charles Sidnor, uh, Senator for District 44, uh, which covers, uh, in, in Baltimore County, it covers Kate, portions of Catonsville, uh, Woodlawn, uh, Villanova, um, and uh, communities within Gwen Oak. I serve on uh, judicial proceedings and, and just welcome you all uh, this evening. Glad to see uh, our constituents from District 44 be. Delegate Stein. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Vice Chair, and Madam Speaker, uh, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, again, I'm Delegate Dana Stein. I represent District 11, Northwest Baltimore County, and I'm on the House Environment and Transportation Committee, where I serve as Vice Chair. Thank you. Delegate Jackson. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Delegate Carl Jackson. I represent Legislative District 8, um, and I sit on the Economic Matters Committee. I uh, just wanted to wish everyone a happy and safe uh, holiday. Thank you. Delegate Forbes. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Kathy Forbes. I represent District 42A, which is Towson and the neighborhoods that surround it. I sit on the Appropriations Committee and on the Education and Economic Development Subcommittee there. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. We look forward to hearing from you. Delegate Cardin. Good evening. And uh, I, did, I echo the words of my colleagues in wishing everybody happy holidays and a happy last night of Hanukkah and um, stay safe. I represent District 11, which is uh, the same district as Delegate Stein, who introduced himself uh, in Northwest Baltimore County. And I serve on the Judiciary Committee and I am chairman of the Civil Law and Civil Procedure Subcommittee. Delegate Grammer. Good evening. Thanks, Mr. Chair. My name is Robin Grammer. I represent District 6. That's southeastern Baltimore County. Uh, I'm on the Judiciary Committee. This session should be very interesting. Uh, try and remember your neighbor this holiday season. It's tough for a lot of people out there right now. Thanks. Delegate Boodler. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, Delegate Joe Boatler and uh, I serve along with Carl Jackson in the 8th District, and I sit on the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you. Delegate Long. Hi, Delegate Bob Long. I represent the 6th Legislative District, Southeast, well, South, Southern Baltimore, yeah, Southeast Baltimore County, excuse me. Uh, I'm on Ways and Means. Thank you. Senator Hedelman. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shelley Hedelman. I'm a senator from District 11, and I serve on the Judicial Proceedings Committee. And happy holidays and stay safe and healthy, everyone. Thank you. Last but not least, Senator Selling. Thank you. Um, I hope everybody's well, and uh, I want to thank the delegates and all the senators and all of them that are a part of this and our participants out there are to be a part of this also. I'm Senator Johnny Salling from the 6th District of Baltimore County, which is Essex, Edgemere, Fort Howard, uh, uh, part of Rosedale, part of Middle River, part of uh, Colgate, a lot. <laughs> uh, I'm part of Budget and Tax, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing all that we can for our businesses. They're having such a tough time right now, our small biggest businesses. So. Uh, let's work together and see what we can do for them. Thank you very much. 
And I'm being told a few folks that joined us uh, that I didn't write down. We have Delegate Erickson, if you're here. Everybody, Lauren Arkin from District 7. That's Joppa, Middle River, sort of north on Baltimore County, uh, up to Parkton, Moncton area. Uh, I serve as the Deputy Minority Whip uh, in the Judiciary Committee. So looking forward to an exciting session. Delegate Shalega. Good evening, everyone. I'm Delegate Kathy Shalega. I also represent District 7 with Delegate Lauren Arkan. Our district goes from Pennsylvania to Middle River along the Hartford Baltimore County line. Wishing you all a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays, and uh, wishing you all stay safe, you and your family during this holiday and as we get through the COVID. Thanks so much, Mr. Chair. And Delegate Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. I'm sorry to be wearing a mask. It's probably a a break for you guys for me to have a mask on, but there are other people in my space, so I gotta keep that covered. So I represent District 12, along with Delegate Ebersole and Delegate Feldmark and Senator Lamb. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad that you all were able to join us. I serve on the Health and Government Operations Committee, and I look forward to your questions and listening to other people give you answers. Thank you. And I believe we're also joined by Delegate Feldmark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jessica Feldmark, representing District 12. Um, I serve on the Ways and Means Committee, including the uh, Revenue Subcommittee and the Election Law Subcommittee. Um, looking forward to hearing from you all tonight, and um, be well and stay safe. Thank you, members, and thanks for bearing with us. Uh, one last piece of housekeeping. We'll also be, we are live streaming this on Facebook right now and recording it so that we will post it on YouTube after this is done. So uh, feel free if the Zoom call uh, is weird for you to watch it, you can also participate by watching it on Facebook Live. So we'll be going to our first uh, person that has indicated they Mr. wanted Chair, to speak. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Delegate Bandari is- Ah, awesome. Delegate Bandari. I missed you, I'm sorry, sir. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, and all my colleagues and our county constituents, I represent District 8, and happy holidays. Thanks. Thank you, Senator, appreciate that. Our first uh, constituent Baltimore County resident is Amy Adams. Amy Adams, if you're here, we'll go ahead and unmute you. And once we know you're unmuted, I'll start the timer and you have three minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on. Uh, good evening. I wasn't planning on talking. I emailed my questions. Oh. And <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, you're well, you, you have the floor. You're welcome to uh, express them and we can ask the members if they have any comment or would like to address them. Oh, sure. Um, so I am a resident and a parent of three Baltimore County students. I am actively learning about the um, Baltimore County school system and trying to advocate for our kids to safely return to school as soon as possible. Um, I would love to hear how the delegates can help us accomplish this goal and um, hold the school a little bit more accountable for the transparency that the parents are asking for. Um, I would love to hear delegates thoughts on how to deal with the COVID pandemic in a new way, maybe not do the same things that we've been doing since the beginning, since now we have a lot more data and we know how to treat it and we know who's more susceptible to it. Um, I would love to hear data on how youth sports um, impact the rise in COVID cases and um, perhaps we could allow children to play sports because they're not in school. Physical activity and socialization is helpful. So those are some of the topics that I'm really interested in hearing you all discuss this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adams. I'm gonna go ahead and one, looking at the list here too, we have, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of folks that sent questions that might not want to speak. So we're gonna keep the topics written and keep going through the list for folks that wanted to talk. All right, Mr. Charles Conklin, if you're there. I'm here. Can you hear me? We sure can. You okay. Have well, thank you. And I, I really appreciate everybody being on here. And there ought to be probably 10 times as many to understand uh, what the delegates doing and the senators and, and uh, 
and they're doing in Baltimore County. I, my question was focused on Baltimore County in general, and so I'm not going to ask that, okay, because that really deals with Johnny Oshesky and et cetera. But I, I want to do one thing that um, I mentioned in my note to the, to the question was transparency. And citizens of, of Maryland have to be more educated on what the challenges are. And so that they understand, you know, that their life depends upon not only what they do in their community does, but what their representatives in Baltimore County Council, as well as Baltimore County or the General Assembly does. And so when Johnny Oshesky, prior to his election, he promoted to us that he's going to increase transparency. And that's what I would like Maryland to do is to increase transparency. Make sure people understand the challenges that you're going through, okay? And what the citizens of Maryland need to do to support the, the issues that will address those challenges. So that's, that's the issue that I have right now. Um, and, and the one thing that I love, and I'm, 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 you, um, I don't show my picture because I'm still eating my dinner, but in any event, it's like, it's very good to hear, see all those smiling faces, but thank you for what you're doing. No, you're muted. Thank you, Cheryl Gottlieb, you're next, and we'll go ahead and unmute you. Hi, so Welcome. my question is about the um, lack of numbers of state employees that we have. Um, I'm looking at this um, from multiple sides as somebody who both uses a lot of state funded services and as somebody who helps people navigate them. Um, even before COVID, if you went to um, an in-person interview for uh, mobility, you would wait for three hours for an interview that had a time slot because they didn't have enough staff to do the interviews. Um, so even though um, unemployment has been getting a lot of attention, things like mobility, food stamps, DDA, um, they're all just as bad. Um, and we can't use the budget deficit as an excuse to stop hiring staff. Um, because people need cer certain services like food stamps um, or if they don't have food stamps or Medicaid or other things that could prove fatal. Um, so something needs to be done about that. Thank you for your perspective, Cheryl. And next we have Cheryl Pastor to give remarks. We'll go ahead and unmute her. And she's also a member of the Baltimore County School Board. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Again, I am Cheryl Pastor, a member of the Baltimore County Public Schools School Board and chair of the Legislative and Government Committee. 2020 has been challenging for our school system as it has been for the nation, states, and local jurisdictions. Certainly your work is always critical, but this year you're called to grapple with new challenges as well. For the first time, the Legislative Committee of BCPS has put out a legislative priorities document which all elected officials, community, and education stakeholders will have digitally and in hard copy. The document outlines the needs and directions of our system, children, and schools. Although we identify several priorities to support our students, I present to you these five. One, the policy and funding recommendations of the Curling Commission as contained in the Blueprint for Maryland's Future Act of 2020. Two, funding and support 
for the Built to Learn Act and the Aging Schools Program. Three, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, hold the system harmless because of its 2020 enrollment by maintaining state mandated funding for fiscal year 2022. Four, increase state funding and resources to support high quality special education programs and services, including compensatory services arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. And five, funding and policies decisions to strengthen school meal programs to provide healthy food for all of our students and expand access for economically disadvantaged students. I look forward to watching your work this session for what you say and do will resound loudly for the present and future of Baltimore County. Collectively, we must be Team Baltimore County. I wanna thank you for your continued support of our school system. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Next, I have Chris Stevenson. We'll go ahead and unmute you if you're here. Oh, you're, you're, un, if you could unmute, Christopher. We have him here. Thank, thank you, you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, just welcome. a quick question. Uh, do you have to be a Baltimore County resident to provide testimony right now? We weren't specific. I guess we figured that mainly Baltimore County residents would be the ones on, but you did sign up, follow the rules, and welcome. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll uh, proceed then. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, Madam Speaker, and members of the Baltimore County Delegation. My name is Christopher Stevenson, and I'm the Senior Policy Analyst with 1199 SEIU, the largest healthcare union in, in the nation, where we represent over 2,000 members in Baltimore County. I come here today to ask this delegation to support essential workers all across the state of Maryland by making the Maryland Essential Workers Protection Act a priority. Unfortunately, we are experiencing the worst pandemic in modern history and little to not enough has been done to ensure that our frontline workers are safe. But when we look at our economy, we have to realize that essential workers are the primary reason we are able to persist throughout this pandemic. Essential workers are our healthcare workers, our first responders, our mail delivery workforce, and our agricultural workers who keep food on our tables. Without them and this opportunity to ensure their safety at work, we can never say that we did what we could to protect all essential workers. For this very reason, our legislation provides the right to safe and hygienic working conditions to ensure that workers are provided PPE and sanitation procedures to keep them safe. It extends hazard pay and healthcare enrollment to provide the assistance workers need during pandemics to take care of themselves and their families. We contend that an emergency action plan is needed in order to provide all employees and employers with certain standards and procedures for all to follow during this and any other pandemic. The unfortunate truth is that many have died in Maryland due to COVID-19, and that's why universal pandemic and bereavement leave is needed. Equally as important, this legislation provides the right to refuse dangerous work under certain conditions and criteria, and last but certainly not least, access to free testing is critical for our frontline workers to decrease the number of further contaminations. What you hear before you today should never be a matter of consideration, but matters of public need to protect this county and this state. 1199 SEIU respectfully asks this body to present and support the Maryland Center of Workers Protection Act. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Appreciate it, Chris. And I know we have plenty of your members in Baltimore County, so appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. Next, we have Claire Landers. You signed up to speak. Hello. Um, hi, so you can hear me? Sure can. Great. You have three minutes. Okay. Hi, my name is Claire Landers. I live with my family in the Pikesville area of District 11. I really appreciate your convening tonight to hear from county constituents as you prepare for what will be an important session in a historic time. Tonight, I ask that the Baltimore County delegation support two 
big issue areas. The first is in support of a bill that Senator Feldman and Delegate Sharkoudian will introduce to end predatory medical debt lawsuits by Maryland's hospitals upon their most vulnerable patients. Here in Baltimore County alone, over 35,000 low-income patients were sued by local hospitals for medical debt between 2009 and 2018. Poor people here have had wages garnished, faced property seizures, and been haunted by bad credit reports because hospitals pursue them relentlessly, half of them for medical bills under $1,000. Hmm. Yet these very same hospitals operate under nonprofit status that allows them to receive millions in tax, break, tax breaks and millions in funding designated specifically to provide health care treatment to low-income patients. This bill would stop lawsuits against low-income patients, require that payment plans don't exceed 5% of a patient's monthly income, and ban wage garnishments and property seizures for medical bills. During this terrible COVID pandemic, it's a matter of public health for all that no one avoids seeking health care out of fear they will incur devastating debt. I urge you to read the written testimony other county residents and organizations have submitted regarding this bill and and um, predatory medical lawsuit practices in Maryland this year. I'm also co-chair of the Leadership Council for Jews United for Justice in Baltimore, and JFJ is a member of the Maryland Coalition for Justice and Police Accountability, which is calling for five necessary and interrelated reforms around policing in Maryland. They are repealing the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights, making investigations into police misconduct transparent, limiting the use of force by law enforcement, restoring control of the Baltimore Police Department to Baltimore City residents, and removing law enforcement from schools. These priorities are essential if we want to move toward the real police accountability, community oversight, and end police violence against black and brown communities in Maryland. Recent polling in Maryland has shown that the public supports police reform and expects the legislator to legislature to take substantive action. So far, 37 legis legislators have signed on to these demands. I hope Baltimore County's legislators will come together to ensure these five priorities succeed. Thank you all and wish you all well in the coming months of deliberation in Annapolis. Thanks. Perfect timing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Appreciate it. Next, we'll move on to, I have Clary Fisting. If you're here, we'll go ahead and unmute you. And I'll give it another second. No worries. I'm just going to put a star next to your name. If you come back on later, we will get you back in. Miss Crystal Francis, if you're there, we'll go ahead and unmute you. But just for some brief updates here. Welcome. There was an organization that did reach out called annuity.org. They are providing financial literacy for returning citizens. I know that is a topic that was brought up briefly at the National Roundtable. Just helping individuals who are returning home try to navigate finances. Um, and so that organization does have a guide that they did ask us to look at and I guess provide some brief feedback. So we'll share that. And if there is any feedback, we can either um, A, coordinate one big response from our group just with feedback, or you can feel free to respond individually. Um, I think it'll probably be easier if we can collect all the feedback in one blast and then just respond to the person who offered um, us the opportunity to uh, Sorry, Crystal, was that the oh, end of you? Give me one second, because Phil, can you take over real quick? I'm being called to speak, so I'm, I apologize. Yes. Get, can, uh, hi, everyone. This is um, Crystal Francis. Just give me one second real quick while I meet the current. I'm multitasking right now. Sure. Okay, Crystal, thank hey, you. Well, hey, Crystal, just to 
Were you were you just talking on another call? Yes, I was trying to get off of the, the speech so that <laughs> okay. I can get on here. <laughs> no worries. One sec. I was I had already started counting, so I thought you were talking to us and we cut you off. So go ahead. Yes, yes. So thank you so much. You got three um, minutes. For the, for yes, I apologize for that. Thank you so much. I am one of those individuals that multitask, so I I am here today. Um, just to first thank you all for the opportunity to speak. Um, as you know, uh, I am heavily involved with the Maryland Alliance for Justice Reform, so I wanted to take this opportunity to just bring some brief initiatives to your attention in hopes that the Baltimore County delegation can support. Um, as you know, um, criminal justice is very important in the state of Maryland, and because of the new challenges with COVID-19, um, we're trying to just navigate the process to ensure that number one, the conditions inside our prisons remain safe. And number two, individuals who are being released into the community have access to the necessary resources and supports that they need. Um, one, I wanna just thank you know the legislators that have always been supportive to Maryland Alliance for Justice Reform's legislative initiatives. And I just wanted to take a brief second here just to highlight some priorities that you um, probably have heard of, but I just wanna make the pitch to my delegation here in the county in hopes that you would support. Um, the first thing that I hope that um, you would support is the establishment of a correctional ombud office. And so what that is, is helping the state of Maryland have independent oversight for our prisons. We have received a lot of information that there's not enough PPE, um, that the data is showing the spread of corona is um, happening rapidly behind, behind the walls. So we would like our legislators to support initiatives to help us be able to ensure that there's an independent oversight so that challenges happening behind the walls can be resolved. Um, the second thing that we hope that you would support is a model prison. Um, we are hoping, you know, that you would support um, a model to just examine the way that we incarcerate in Maryland, particularly for youth. It's not an effective process. So Maryland Alliance for Justice Reform is proposing a um, model prison um, legislation to help the state of Maryland develop a strategy that puts rehabilitation and deterrence in, in, in an important light, not just deterring, but ensuring that people are actually rehabilitated so when they're released, they don't commit crime. And then the third thing I would like to just highlight here is um, we hope that there will be an establishment of a reentry council. We did draft legislation, but we decided not to put it forth this session because Secretary Green did endorse the establishment of a statewide reentry council. I know local jurisdictions like Prince George's County and Baltimore County have rolled out their own local versions of reentry councils, which helps bring all the stakeholders and criminal justice together to plan public safety and reentry together. And so we are just putting that out as an alert just in case we do know COVID is taking over. So the secretary has not been able to actually implement the reentry council, but he has given us a promise that he would. But if that does not take place, we do plan to introduce legislation. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. And thank you to everyone that is doing great work on the Judiciary Committee. Right by the bell. Thank you, Crystal. Next, we have Dr. Renee Murrell. If you're here, we'll go ahead and unmute you. Here. Welcome. Well, thank you. This is my first time joining it. I am so excited about it. Of course, you have um, three minutes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Dr. Renee Morrell. I am an adjunct professor at the Community College of Baltimore Camp. County. I am also a retired victim specialist with 40 years of experience um, as a social worker for the FBI. I recently retired. And what I was so important, what was so important to me was that I give back and equip new uh, people who were interested in coming into human services with the tools they needed to get on the ground and to do effective work. What we know throughout our area and right here in Baltimore County is that thousands of residents turn to local community colleges as affordable and effective ways to start a career, learn a new trade, and begin a better life. Our community colleges are anchor institutions in many of our local communities offering employment, education, and a path to economic empowerment. 
Sadly, for students, staff, and faculty like me, the employees at all but one of Maryland's community colleges lack the right to collectively bargain with their administration. This means that in virtually all decision making, the professionals who are on the ground at local campuses and working directly with students have no voice. As my colleagues will also tell you, our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. Our lack of voice has had a serious consequence for our students, including loss of office hours and access to their instructors outside of class time. As Maryland looks to recover from COVID, our community colleges will play a critical role. They will not only provide instructions to a generation of young Marylanders, but they will also um, be so instrumental in a potentially an extraordinary amount of professional retraining for those who need a fresh start in this new economy. For so many Maryland workers, our community colleges will be the lifeline they need to recover. And to guarantee that our community colleges provide the structure, atmosphere, and instruction that working Marylanders will need in a COVID recovery, it is essential that educators and staff who work with them day in and day out have a voice at the table. No administration has the firsthand knowledge or expertise that we as faculty and staff will bring to bear in decision making. So I'm asking you today to join us and commit to passing legislation that will grant the right to collectively bargain to community college faculty and staff and to do so with a veto proof majority. Faculty and staff need to have a voice to ensure that conditions at our community college can be as fruitful as possible for student learning and economic recovery. I have worked for 40 years providing assistance and, and recovery for things like, um, as a social worker, I was on the ground at Sandy Hook um, in Maryland at Columbia shooting and uh, Thank you, the Dr. Pulse Cup, and we just need help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I have Dan Mayer signed up to speak. Dan, if you're there, we're going to unmute you. Give it another second. No worries, I'm just going to make another mark and we'll come I'm back. I don't think that they're in here. That's okay. All right, and I have a Miss, Miss Patima. I don't have a last name, but if you're here, we'll go ahead and unmute you. Miss Patima. I don't believe they are here either. Understood. Appreciate it. All right. I'm going to go to the Honorable Jerry Brewster, Chairman of the Board for the Maryland State Fair. Sir, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Can hear you just fine, sir. <laughs> well, minutes. first of all, it, it's great to see all of you, and, and thank you for your service under the most trying and difficult times imaginable. One year ago, we were hosting all of you at the Maryland State Fair for this uh, pre-legislative meeting, and we look forward to the day when we can have you back. In that year, a lot has changed. This year in Annapolis, you all are going to get asked a lot about the State Fair when the discussion of sports wagering comes up, and we want you to have the answers. And, and to be proud of your Maryland State Fair. A lot of people don't realize it, but we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We're owned by the people of Maryland and we're led by volunteers. Uh, we're full-time volunteers running it. And as soon as the coronavirus hit in March, we want you to know what your Maryland State Fair did, which was remarkable, not only on a statewide level, but on a national level, where we were referred to as a national model, what we did in Baltimore County for how to step up and help people and combat the coronavirus. We first turned over the Cow Palace for testing multiple days a week, and we're the first location in all of Maryland to offer free coronavirus testing without a doctor's note and without an appointment. Then we turned over the exhibition hall to the American Red Cross for emergency blood drives every week as well. Then many of you participated in the Saturday Baltimore County pop-up food market. Delegate Guyton, you and your family were there regularly 
giving out food to people in need. And then on, on Sundays, uh, where we met a year ago with, with this group, uh, we turned it over to, to Amigos of Baltimore County and For My City, uh, and along with Alejandra Yovanovitch's coordination, to, to serve tens of thousands on a, on a Sunday, every Sunday, throughout the worst part of the pandemic. And, and the need in the Latino and immigrant community was so great, we had folks lined up at 5.30 in the morning and didn't even start till nine. Then we had, we had farmers got sick, couldn't take care of the, their animals. We said, bring them to the Maryland State Fair. We've got 600 stalls, we will take care of your animals. Then we, they needed places for emergency management vehicles. The Baltimore County Police, State Police, we said, bring them to the campus, we'll hook them up. We've been doing everything that we can to be of service but we do have needs and, and, uh, and we wanna give back and we wanna be good stewards of Baltimore County. We just hooked up 7,000 solar panels that plant 60 new trees, but sports wagering is coming up and, and we've got 42 aging buildings and that revenue is a long-term revenue stream for us uh, if we get sports wagering with mobile at the Maryland State Fairgrounds. Baltimore County stood tall and proud for Pimlico and Laurel last year with $375 million. Well, this year is Baltimore County's turn. Help out our own Maryland State Fairgrounds. Get us the resources that, that we need to keep operating for another 141 years so we can continue to give back to the community and continue to make each and every one of you proud. Uh, we we wanna be there for a long time to come, but we need your help this year with sports wagering and, and all the surrounding communities, uh, they, they voted to support it. And you all, the county house and senate delegations, Democrat and Republican alike in the 2020 session, unanimously supported us having sports wagering. Please help us get that this year. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate the comments and the work that you do as well. Thank you. So we are, uh, we've been joined by, and we weren't sure if he's gonna make it, so glad he can, uh, County Executive Jenny Oshevsky, Jr. I believe you can, we made you a co-host. You can unmute yourself when you're ready. I think we got it. Welcome, sir. This technology stuff yet, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to you and all of the members of the House and Senate delegation for uh, being here and for uh, leading by example uh, by inviting our residents in to uh, speak directly with you as you enter into yet another session. Um, I just want to say as county executive how blessed I feel to have such a wonderful and talented delegation here in Baltimore County. It is great to see our screens filled with people from so many different walks of life, both in the legislature from Team Baltimore County, but also from the residents and advocates who are uh, bringing their unique perspectives to this process. Uh, as anyone who lives in or near Baltimore County can tell you, we deal in results here. And it is a credit to each and every member of this delegation that we are able to work across party lines, across different levels of government, and across our geographic and community uh, differences to make sure that we are bringing home results for every community in Baltimore County at the end of every legislative session. Uh, I know that we will continue to serve as an example of that uh, this year as well. I also just wanna say how lucky we feel uh, in Baltimore County to have Speaker Jones as a member of this delegation. She has shown tremendous leadership working with members of the delegation uh, to bring home some really important issues and lead the way with all of you. Um, while having a statewide perspective and also keeping the best interests of Baltimore County at heart. So thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, for your time and, uh, you know, also being present with county issues in addition to your statewide responsibilities. Um, and it's important for all, you know, for the for residents to know how important it is to have this effective engaged delegation, uh, because without them, local government cannot do the job um, that we're being asked to do. And so I, again, feel so lucky to have so many talented legislators on Team Baltimore County. This year has certainly challenged us in ways I don't think any of us ever expected. And it is a year that has demanded swift and decisive action and has required us working across, again, party lines, geographic lines, levels of government to just meet the need because that's what government's supposed to do. And we're proud of the ways we've done that in Baltimore County. We look forward to partnering with uh, the delegation, uh, with our residents in the session ahead. And uh, we will continue working every day to keep our residents safe and protected, but to also drive progress in the many important areas you all have identified tonight. So anything we can do to support you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the delegation, uh, we look forward to doing.
that last part got cut off. No, thank you again for making this opportunity available for our, our residents across Baltimore County. We're, we're truly lucky for all of you. And best of luck this session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a partner. Normally during the session and also during uh, the pandemic, your office has been amazing with communicating with us, open to partnering, and just keeping us informed of what's going on in our district. So very much appreciate your leadership and your time with that. Thank you. Next on our list, we have Jeff Klima, who signed up to speak. If you're here, we'll go ahead and unmute you. And Cole, let me know if you don't see them. I do not believe they are here. No worries. Next. Do we have Lindy, excuse me, Linda Dorsey Walker? She is here. Welcome, Ms. Walker. Good to see you. Good evening. Hello, everyone. And happy holidays to you all. I wanted to uh, follow up on some things that uh, I had previously brought up at a meeting in which uh, Senator Cooley was involved, I shared this information, and she said, put it in writing and see if there's some way it can be worked in to this session. This is a Judiciary Committee uh, issue. Uh, this year, when California experienced unprecedented seasons, uh, uh, unprecedented season of wildfires, uh, they offered nonviolent prisoners and prisoners nearing the end of their uh, sentence the opportunity to train as forest firefighters with the understanding that after a specified period of time fighting wildfires, they would be permanently released from prison. After months of fighting wildfires, many of those prisoners who grew up in crime-filled urban communities, when placed in that outdoor setting and having their survival skills tested on an everyday basis, began to view themselves as fire professionals with a valuable skill set that is much needed and well respected. They were allowed to live freer lives as firefighters, albeit isolated in the forest areas, than they would have imprisoned. Upon being released, some of the formerly incarcerated asked to be hired on permanently as wildfire fighters. California said they would consider taking prisoners from other states. This is a talent pool that California and many Western states will continue to need throughout uh, as because of climate change. Maryland has a huge number of returning citizens forced to return jobless to the same mean streets that led them to a life of crime. I am requesting that Maryland develop legislation that creates a memorandum of understanding with California and other Western states that would allow willing prisoners from Maryland to receive much needed professional training as forest, fighter, uh, forest firefighters, a valuable service, and then the opportunity to shorten their sentence, turn their lives around, and become permanent law-abiding citizens. That's a condition if they hire you afterwards. With well-paying jobs, who knows? This might even later become a means of increasing minority presence throughout the forest firefighter services of, throughout the entire country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker, for bringing that to our attention. I have a Phoebe Evans, and excuse me if I'm butchered the name, uh, Latosha. Yes, hi. Hi, how'd I do? Good, good, Latosha is correct. Oh, good. So this Welcome. is my, my third year to be speaking before you um, about the issue of school overcrowding. I'm a Towson High parent, and um, this is the time, the year, to really bring home the Build to Learn Act money. I know it passed last year, but we don't have the money and our schools are still overcrowded. In the past year, our 12th trailer has been added to Towson High School. And because the school is so overcrowded, it really makes it harder for our schools to reopen in a pandemic when we have such overcrowding. So, so please finally just get the job done so that we can start the process of relieving the overcrowding in our schools. The second thing I'm here to speak to you today about is the Public Schools Provision of Menstrual Hygiene Product Act. This was House Bill 208 that I am so happy to hear that the, the 
see last year in this 2020 session that our Baltimore County House of Delegates were strong supporters of. I am now asking that some of our Baltimore County Senators um, co-sponsor this bill because you got it done in the House of Delegates, but it's time for it to pass in the, the Senate as well. All right, now I'm holding up a period pack. Tomorrow, we will be distributing with Student Support Network 600 period packs at um, four schools, Parkville, Owings Mills High School, uh, Lock Raven Technical Academy, and Michelle Guyton will be leading the uh, Cockeysville Middle School distribution. So these are, this is why we need the Provision of Menstrual Hygiene Product Act, because there are students who are missing school because they do not have period products accessible to them in the bathrooms where they need them. Um, and that takes, that takes them away from attending school. Uh, a quarter of students report, or in women report, having missed work or school because of lack of access to period products. Scotland recently passed uh, legislation to uh, provide menstrual products free to all of its citizens. Our near neighbors, the state of Virginia this past year, passed a public schools provision of menstrual products at, uh, act as well. So it's time to Maryland to, to join that uh, and to, to do that. We provide toilet paper free in bathrooms. Menstrual products also need to be provided in public school bathrooms as well. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Renee Varela. If you're there, go ahead and unmute you. Sounds like someone's unmuted. I already spoke, thank you. <laughs> oh, uh, my bad, my, excuse me. No worries, we'll just go on to the next one. Ron Boone, if you're there, we'll go ahead and unmute you. And Cole, let me know if, oh, there you are, sir. If We'll go ahead and unmute you. One more time. Cole, if you could go ahead and unmute. No, I'm trying to do so. Are we good? There you go. Go ahead, sir. You've got three minutes. Okay, thanks. Real quick before I start, um, I'm from 42B. My name is Ron Boone. Michelle Guyton's our uh, state delegate. She's wonderful with community outreach and uh, constituent response. So, Michelle, thank you. Um, uh, quick kudos to our county executive. Glad to see him. He's he's wonderful. Can't wait to support him. And a shout out to uh, Delegate uh, Speaker Jones. Adrian, I still have the wonderful chicken trout uh, satchel that I won at your drawing all those years ago at the uh, Diamond Ridge Woodlands Golf Course and one of your very first fundraisers when you first started running for uh, State House of Delegates. So uh, congratulations on your well-deserved success. I'm here tonight to talk about Optum, who is the uh, third-party Medicaid billing service for the state of Maryland. When uh, needy Medicaid patients receive medical services, uh, they, their provider must bill Optum to get the federal government payment uh, for Medicaid. Uh, Optum then makes that Medicaid payment to the service. The previous provider, Beacon Behavioral Health, did wonderful service for years, but Optum won the low-bid process, took over January 1st. Uh, their programming failed immediately. They didn't make any payments until the middle of the spring, and then they started to make estimated payments, and to this point in time, as you can tell from several Sun Paper articles and editorials, they're still making late or no payments or erroneous payments. I get my information from the accountant for a small medical provider um, who says that she has to put in hours of hours of work and still can't get the correct payments from Optum. The problem started well before COVID, and in three weeks, it'll be a year. Uh, when and they're a major uh, nationwide corporation, so they really should be able to provide uh, Maryland with better service. In the case of one of my family members, uh, his medical uh, variety of medicines and dosage had to be arranged through Dr. Michael Hayes at the University of Maryland, specifically with a small clinic, the only one in the region that can provide it. Um, they're not getting their money from Medic from Optum, so that. Uh, 
if they decide, as some small medical providers are saying, that they can no longer afford to maintain Medicaid payments, then um, he's faced with a life-threatening situation where he can't get the medications that he needs. So I'm hoping that, I realize this is pretty much an executive branch issue, but I'm hoping there can be some legislative branch intervention that, um, that brings to Peter Francho or the governor's office um, some force, some attention to make Optum either step up and, and provide what it contractually obligated itself to the state of Maryland and, and get a system in place that makes Medicaid payments on time and correctly, or else um, pull the bid and reissue it and get us somebody so that we don't have needy Medicaid people all around the state starting to lose services, uh, in the case of methadone patients, putting them back on the street. So uh, hoping the delegation can address that. I, I think it's Senator Hayes who has a committee for it. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next, we have Yara Sheck, if she's here. We'll go ahead and unmute you. I think I see her right at the bottom. Distribution Coordinator for the Student Support Network. During the pandemic, the Student Support Network has now distributed over $2.2 million in food and essential items since distributions began on March 20th. Baltimore County government, for which we're very grateful, funding has funded through the CARES Act and the federal extension of the Summer Meals Program, providing the majority of the food we distribute, which now totals the equivalent of 1.9 million meals. In addition, we've distributed tens of thousands of diapers, period packs, as well as thousands of bags of essential items, including toilet paper, laundry, soap, and personal care items. We've mailed out over $100,000 in grocery gift cards and delivered to families who cannot access our food distribution sites. I wanna thank many of you for visiting our sites on Fridays and a special shout out to Delegate Forbes and Delegate Guyton who coordinate two of our distribution sites. The numbers of people assisted through the network distribution sites has increased from about 4,100 individuals in early October to over 6,100 individuals in late November. With the new surge of COVID-19, it is expected that the need will continue to increase during the winter months. Families are getting poorer and are now reporting the inability to pay utility bills. It is un currently unclear when any new funding from the federal government will be available for state and local governments. According to Feeding America, the budget shortfall needed to successfully address food insecurity in Maryland before the pandemic was $361 million. In Baltimore County alone, that's $49 million. The $10 million for food assistance statewide recently announced by the Hogan administration is only 20% of what Baltimore County alone would need for a year. In addition, this $10 million was not given directly to local governments to purchase food, but was given instead to food banks, providing little flexibility for spending these funds in areas not necessarily being covered by food banks or pantries. We simply cannot wait for the federal government to address the crisis facing our families, living with food insecurity or facing eviction. Whatever you can do to reinforce the safety net can only help our state in the recovery. I ask you to seek legislative funding solutions at the state level. In addition, as a long-term education advocate, and this will come as no surprise to many of you, I urge you to vote to override the veto of the Blueprint for Maryland's Future Act, which will support our Maryland schools and allow the Built to Learn Act to provide necessary school construction funding to come to our county. Thank you for all you do and stay safe during session. Thank you, Yara. Next person I have on my list is Leslie Grant. Who's interested in addressing the delegations. Thank you, um, I'm Leslie Grant. I live in 42B. My internet is unstable. I'm in the rural part of Baltimore County. Um, I'm a general dentist and speech and language pathologist, and I want to give a shout out to my professions. Uh, your dental providers who were shut down in the early part of the pandemic were amongst the first to bring the multitude of personal protective equipment and donate it uh, in much needed areas uh, because we are well aware 
than mask and PPE uh, protect against aerosolized pathogens. We had a bountiful supply. However, once our offices opened, we were not uh, able to readily access through the distribution systems. So I want everyone to be aware that we are primary care providers also, and we need to be able to access the things that other primary care health providers in Maryland access, especially during the pandemic. We are amongst your front line of healthcare providers. And even though we are experts in injection safety and we treat multiple generations and families, um, we are not yet permitted to administer vaccines generally. However, with the um, December 8th um, directive from the secretary, we are included in the vaccinators. And finally, um, as a reminder, uh, with the exception of pregnant women and uh, the pilot program for dual eligibles, uh, Maryland does not have a comprehensive adult dental benefit. Uh, throughout the pandemic, if, for those of you who are aware of dental missions of mercy that occur throughout the state, we have not been, those have been canceled and multitudes of people who line up uh, the day before, the night before to receive uh, free dental care generally for adults who've not been able to access this. So this is a compounding problem that your constituents are having. I'll be happy to discuss it further um, if you would like. And I thank you for being so accessible, such a great bipartisan, uh, hardworking group of people for the residents of Baltimore County and happy holidays to you all. Thank you, Ms. Grant. Next, I have Ms. Diana Bergman from the southwest side of the county. If you're here, we'll go ahead and unmute you. I think I saw your name. Diana. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome. You got I three minutes. So, I'm so excited. This is the first time we get to wear our pajamas to this. This is like awesome. So I want to start off by saying that I miss everybody. I miss seeing you in person. And I'm just like excited. I'm pumped. Okay, the first thing I'm going to bug you guys about, of course, is overriding our education legislator and the companion bills that are going to go along with that. In addition, I want to see Maryland State provide a pathway of support for jurisdictions recovering for um, recovering through a cyber um, ransomware attack. Baltimore County recently experienced that and we still haven't gotten our heads above water when it comes to that. So I think the state should be able to provide all 24 jurisdiction um, a pathway to help them during that recovery phase of recovering through a ransom attack. The other piece is you hear a lot of parents asking and demanding to open schools back up because our children need access to that in-person education. What you don't hear is recommendations on how to do it safely. So thinking out of the box here, just completely out of the box, what if our legislature starts having conversations about looking at a year-round schedule? A year-round schedule that's going to give us flexibility to utilize a school building um, with different pods of students that go in in a hybrid approach to safely have smaller classrooms, okay? And providing that year-round calendar, it would help us catch up with that misinstruction. So it's something that we're capable of doing. I mean, come on, we put a man on the moon. So if we put a man on the moon, we could figure this out, everybody. And the way I see it is that we could do it safely. And we have to think creatively. But we do have to offer that opportunity and be able to do it as safely as possible, okay? Whether our kids are gonna be still virtually on a hybrid mode, but in person, those classrooms have to stay small. My um, sister down in the Keys just recently tested positive for COVID and she's a teacher at a private school. And unfortunately, her whole class now got shut down. All her preschooler kids had to go home because she got compromised. They didn't have proper PPE. And, and that's something that needs to be prioritized and looked at to make sure we could secure that for our educators and our children if we're gonna bring them safely back into the building in small groups. So best of luck, I'm excited. I believe in each and every one of you to make this possible for all of Baltimore County and for the state of Maryland. Ashley, you wanna say hi? Hi. Hi. 
I love you guys all and all the work you do. And I really believe in you. You could make a world of difference. And I'm so much counting on you. So thank you for this time. And I think this is by far the best one we've had because we get to be in pajamas. And I'm just being very positive about this. But we have to think outside the box and do right for our kids and our teachers and every single person in our community. So hang in there. And I got to give them chips. Bye. Of course. Thank you, Diana. No, have a good one. Yeah. So I want to make sure I'm muted. Thanks, Diana. I want to go back to some folks that I'd started to make sure if they didn't get, if they haven't gotten on yet. Um, I had met, asked before there was a Renee, a Varela. She had some questions about renewable energy standards. I didn't know if she was, she was with us. I do not believe so. No. Okay. No worries. And going back Clary Fusting, if she's here. And if that's no, that's fine. Dan Mayer, if you wanted to make some remarks, you're welcome to. Also not present. That's all right. And Fatima and Shamim Razi, if you're here. Or if we see them there. They're following on Facebook. They're following on Facebook. Understood. Gotcha. So we're, we're past an hour and we've gone through the list, which is completely fine. Uh, what I'd like to offer for anyone that's uh, participating right now, if you'd like to make some remarks or ask them to the delegation, you're more than welcome to raise your hand in the participation box and we can go ahead and bring you up. And if not, you can go on from there. Cool. Let me know if we have some folks. One second. No worries. Mr. Chair, we have someone in the chat. That's uh, Mary Taylor who would like to speak. I don't right. know. That works. Yeah, just I perfect. see her hand right here. Can we go ahead and unmute. Yeah, Mary? This, is, this is Janice Washington. I signed up to speak. Oh, did you? Got you. Excellent. Uh, so we'll have this. Uh, Janice, we'll let you go first and then we'll go to Mary Taylor. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Go ahead. I want to thank the Baltimore delegation for this opportunity and to wish everybody a happy holiday. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Um, we, our Baltimore County chapter is uh, represented by our, uh, our chairman of our connections and social action, Ms. Janelle Herring, is on the line. And um, I also represent the state uh, undergraduate and graduate chapters of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority for the state of Maryland. And uh, we have been very active uh, throughout the year uh, with our uh, voter engagement program, uh, working very hard uh, uh, virtually, getting uh, people registered to vote, educated about the issues and out to vote. And I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank um, uh, Ms. Cheryl Pasteur, who is on the uh, Board of Education, a former principal of mine, who assisted our efforts in reaching out to young people in the schools doing this virtual uh, 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 arrangement to get them uh, educated and registered to vote. And we're very pleased with the outcome of the election with our own member of our uh, sorority, uh, uh, Senator uh, Kamala Harris, who became the pres vice president-elect. We have a legislative agenda that we uh, are calling upon the, um, the uh, uh, delegation to consider. We are very concerned about the veto of the HBCU funding that passed both houses. We understand that the pandemic uh, took precedence over this, but we would like to know what would be uh, the steps that the delegation will be take, taking to override the veto of the governor, because we do need to support and provide equal funding for the uh, uh, historically black colleges in the state of Maryland, Morgan, Bowie, UMES, and Coppin. And even though neither one of these institutions are in the county, many uh, uh, residents have attended these colleges. We know the value of them and we want them equally funded. We're also concerned about the governor's redistricting plan. We helped with the census count and encouraging people to sign up for the census. And so we're going to be watching very carefully what is the redistricting plan 
and how it's going to be affecting our, our, our district. Uh, third, we are very interested in the police reform. We uh, uh, want to know what's the status of the commission that um, Delegate Vanessa Atterbury is leading. Uh, we know that the Speaker of the House has, has, has um, you know, in, encouraged that, and we want to know more about the outcome. Now, of course, uh, with COVID-19 and with the um, uh, approval of the vaccines and the impact that it has had on the African-American community and brown communities, we will want to know what will be the plan to distribute the vaccine uh, equally to our communities. And more importantly, we want to know how the Baltimore County, um, County Office, as well as delegations gonna help educate and encourage our people to become vaccinated in order to protect themselves and the community. We are, of course, uh, very concerned about uh, education equity, especially in the Northwest District. And we will be looking to our Board of Education members uh, to uh, follow up on the legislative uh, suggestions to provide equity and, and, and parity in that community. Thank you, Mr. Again, Washington. I want to thank you for this opportunity and we look forward to working with you in the future. Excellent, thank you for your remarks. Miss mm -hmm. Mary Taylor, we'll go ahead and unmute you. Hi, good evening. Uh, Mr. Young, thank you for coordinating this. It's uh, been very resourceful and I've learned a lot just listening. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Mary Taylor. I'm from District 7, Essex, Maryland. I also am the admin of the Reopen Baltimore County Public Schools Group. Uh, many of the delegates and senators should have already received an email from our group today asking them to attend our rally on January 9th in Towson at Patriot Square for uh, a safe reopening plan from Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, I'd like to just make a comment. I would like to say on behalf of our over 3,500 members of Baltimore County Public School Reopening Group, uh, Ms. Bergman saying that we do not have any credible resources asking for this reopening. If anybody would like them resources, I'd be glad to email them to you. Uh, the other thing is, is Blueprint Maryland is just basically the Kerwin bill. I'm asking every senator and delegate to vote no. Uh, Governor Hogan vetoed that bill last year, and if it passes, I hope that he does the same again this year. Uh, as far as BCPS asking for funding, uh, we as parents and stakeholders have asked transparency about the CARES Act money that was allocated to BCPS for COVID, and we have on that whatsoever. Now, I'd like to say, as a parent and a stakeholder in Baltimore County, we have many issues with the reopening, especially the reopening of schools. There are stakeholders and parents of students. We're very concerned because we're left very little feedback on our inquiries. So what I would like to know is that we know that the Baltimore County delegates do not have direct control over BCPS policies and procedures. But what we would like to know, is there a bill or a law that can be created to give some oversight to the county? Because as we all are aware of, the emails that have been sent, the letters that have been sent back and forth between County Executive Zolzeski and Dr. Williams, Superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools, Baltimore County Public Schools is basically not, does not have to be transparent to anybody but themselves. So that's really just my really basic question to both the senators and the delegates. We want to know how we can initiate a bill so that we can make Baltimore County Public Schools more transparent to the stakeholders, especially the parents of the students who attend these schools. Thank you for your time and happy holidays. Thank you, Mary. And for those that have submitted questions that also didn't mention that they wanted to speak, we'll be uh, providing answers for everybody that had said something uh, prior to the Zoom tonight. Uh, next, uh, and also if, if there's folks that asked to speak or said they sent something in but we didn't include you on in the list, just raise your hand, put it in the chat, and we'll get to you as well. Next, I have Mr. Mitch Tropin. If you're here, we'll go ahead and unmute you. Okay. Welcome. Hi, my name is Mitch Tropin. I'm with SDIU Local 500. When I'm busy at the North Pole, I teach at CCBC. 
I'm very proud of my colleagues, my part-time colleagues at Dundalk, Catonsville, and Essex. And the best gift I can imagine them receiving is the right to collective bargaining. And it's a gift that this delegation can help provide. I'm asking everyone in the Baltimore County delegation, in the House and Senate, to not only support, but champion the Community College Collective Bargaining Bill. The bill does one important thing. It gives a voice to adjuncts at CCBC and the other community colleges in Maryland. And this is really important. Right now, we're in, if you're an adjunct, you're invisible. You really don't have any access to speak to the administration. Collective bargaining will change that. It's a very simple thing. Uh, as I told Maggie McIntosh, all we are asking is give talk a chance. It will do so much to improve the working conditions of all part-time faculty at CCBC and at, and at Prince George's and Frederick. And it's a very simple thing to approve. It has passed this house, it passed the house before, but now we need to make sure we have a veto-proof majority. And this bill will finally pass the Senate, I promise you. And I wanna wish everyone a merry holiday. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have a, pardon me if I pronounce it wrong, uh, Lakea Newkirk. Hi, good afternoon, evening. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. you. Three minutes, ma'am. Awesome. So my name is Lakia um, Newkirk. I represent Friends of Southeast Baltimore County. This is an organization that was created in response to COVID as a means for Southeast Baltimore County residents to assist their federal fellow um, neighbors in Southeast Baltimore County with providing PPE, paying for internet, providing loaner laptops, um, technical assistance, accessing county and state federal services. And I just wanna talk about a few um, issues that we've observed in trying to help connect families in Baltimore County. Um, access to housing advocacy is almost um, obsolete. Many of the services or service providers that you believe um, oh, just call this place or that place. They don't actually provide um, housing advocacy services for Baltimore County residents, um, many of them for Baltimore City, but mostly not for Baltimore County and or places um, like Legal Aid, for example, require that individuals be um, low income families to receive um, assistance. Um, and we also have had many um, problems with um, individuals who are um, not native to the country. Um, being able to access those um, services as well. Um, safe and healthy housing um, for seniors raising young children. So we have about a four year waiting list for housing with Baltimore County. Um, that's one thing. Access to behavioral health services. Um, so uh, children are dying in COVID. They were dying before, but uh, we've had a significant amount of young people, um, especially um, young people of color, who are um, losing their life to suicide um, and to mental illness. I'm not quite sure what you guys can do, but um, their, their parents' um, understanding of um, access to services that may be there and or um, service providers who are supposed to be in the community are not actually in the community. Um, free transportation for local and uh, community college and workforce development centers. These were some of the things we were looking at before um, COVID, just as individuals. Um, someone spoke on justice efforts. There was an effort um, that was vetoed by Governor Hogan for what was called the gender response uh, pre-release. At this point, uh, Maryland uh, correctional institutions don't have a pre-release center for, for women, and that's a problem. Um, as many of our, at least Baltimore County residents, are women-led families. And so that, of course, has um, generational issues for young people in Baltimore County and the state at large. Um, and someone also spoke about school overcrowding. Um, and there was just um, a resolution um, made for Baltimore County adequate public uh, facilities ordinance, and it did not include um, a very um, diverse, diverse group of stakeholders um, in that organization. And I'm not sure what you guys can do, but it would be great if you could encourage them to include groups like NAACP, CASA, ACLU. Um, that's it. Thank you. 
Oh, I beat the clock. Ooh. You did. You did. <laughs> All right. Next, uh, Paulette Hammond, you have requested to speak. Go ahead and. Yeah, yes. Let... Oh, oh, hi. Welcome. Oh, okay. Now I'm unmuted. Yeah, I think this is fabulous. I think we need more of these. Um, I don't know how to reach out people who are not technically experienced like the rest of us. But I did have a comment about Governor Hogan's vetoes. When are you all going to override them? Specifically, the one I'm most interested in, which most of you voted for, the chlorpyrifos ban. What's the timeline? I would, we would really like to know how soon you guys are going to override his vetoes because they all were good bills that got passed and they need to be passed. Anybody? Thanks, Paul. No, thanks, Paul. And then honestly, it's an easy question. We have to address veto overrides immediately when the session starts. Um, I hope you know, so. I hope so. Do not have a Let's list. Get that out of the way, okay? <laughs> uh, statutorily, we have to. Uh, but also, yeah. um, uh, we don't have a list of all of the vetoes that will be taking place. However, in terms of addressing There's a lot. Them, yep. In terms of addressing them, they have to be done right away when the session begins. I hope so. But thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Easy, generally easy question. Next, uh, Ali Carter is requested to speak. We'll go ahead and unmute you. Hello, thank Welcome. you so much. Uh, my name is Allie Carter. I currently serve as lead organizer for Strong Schools Maryland, but I actually was a Baltimore County teacher for seven years. Uh, I was a vocal music and theater arts teacher, go Dundalk Middle School Owls. Um, and I am here for speaking as a teacher. Uh, in my classroom, I had the privilege of teaching students from 54 countries speaking 21 languages. These students had to persevere in class sizes as large as 46. My first three years teaching, I taught 12 classes each of between 39 and 46 students each. Sometimes a little lower than that, but very rarely. If our students didn't have something, educators made it appear because that's what educators do. We just make things happen. And unfortunately, a lot of educators had to take on second, if not third jobs, just to make ends meet in their own households and provide for students in ways that our current funding formula does not. We have a responsibility to our students. We owe a debt to them for a solid world-class education. And we have an opportunity before us once again with the Blueprint for Maryland's Future to finally make that happen. I know many of you in the Baltimore County delegation voted in support of the Blueprint. And with that, you made a promise to the students of Maryland that their futures, their education is a priority to you, that they matter to you. And I'm so thankful that you have made that promise. And with that, I ask that you keep that promise to these students, that the supports and resources provided by the Blueprint will be at their disposal so that they have a world-class competitive education, that educators can be paid what they deserve on par with uh, similar professions and have a diverse teaching force that looks like the students which we serve. That access to early childhood education is available to everyone without a financial barrier so that all of our students can have a leg up in their educational careers and have access to early interventions so that their needs are met throughout their educational career. So that ca career and technical education programs are expanded so that our students can leave their schools not only with a diploma, but ready to enter the workforce in a way that will be beneficial to them and their community. In doing all of this, it is an investment in the economy of Maryland. Studies show that investing in schools will produce a robust economy. And I know speaking of the economy, some of you may be thinking, can we really afford to do this in this economy? And to that I will say, we can't afford not to. The last time this funding formula was looked at was before the smartphone was invented. It's time. It's time to pay to our students what they are owed. It is time to provide to them what they deserve in their schools. 
And if you have any questions about the blueprint or the Kerwin Commission's recommendations or want to get involved in advocacy, I will put my email in the chat and I look forward to conversation with all of you who reach out. And I'm so thankful to the delegation for your support of education, for your support of educators, for your support of students and your investment in the future of Maryland. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. And uh, also for folks that have been with us since the beginning, we've kept a, a solid uh, group of participants. Uh, People have asked specific questions. Uh, we've already had legislators reach out to them because they know who they are. We also have the contact information for everyone that had reached out to participate to answer their questions directly or follow up uh, in the future. So just so you know, uh, we're hearing from everyone. Uh, folks that have specific questions, we're not ignoring, uh, but we are taking them and getting you uh, up-to-date answers and uh, contacting and uh, engaging after this is done. So a few more folks have asked to speak. I have Jean. Henningsen, you're still there. Yes, can you hear me? Can, we can, you have three minutes, ma'am, welcome. Great, thank you. So um, I live in District 10, but I'm also the development director for Turnaround, uh, the county's rape crisis center. And so I just wanted to highlight that service providers such as Turnaround who work with survivors of sexual violence, domestic violence, and human trafficking uh, are facing potentially very significant cuts uh, to our federal funding, up to 40% of one of our, our largest uh, funding streams. On top of that, um, also a downturn in individual donations given the economic climate. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing a, a huge spike in need. At one point, we recorded a 300% increase in requests from survivors for help uh, finding shelter. Um, we're seeing more and more people who are coming to us who have lost their jobs and thus uh, can become more dependent on their abuser for financial security. So uh, we want to see efforts uh, from the delegation to ensure that robust funding is available to support survivors uh, in the county and in the state as a whole, of course, um, especially in the event that uh, this federal cut happens um, and turnaround is, you know, certainly available uh, as a resource if, if folks have questions uh, about those cuts and about the, the increased uh, need. So thank you. Thank you. Next, I have Susan Radke. And I know where you're from, Susan District 44B. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. It's so good to see all the delegates and the senators and everyone attending here. Um, my name is Susan and I'm from the Indivisible Group in um, Central Maryland and a member of the Catonsville Indivisible Group. The Indivisible Group, um, we would love to be able to um, support all the bills, but... I've heard that. Oh, she got muted. Concerned about uh, declaring racism as a public health crisis in the state of Maryland. And within that bill, we would like the bill to contain an implicit bias training and microaggression training for all health care workers. Uh, we also do will support the police reform bills and would like that to also in the police reform bills. We would also like to see an Office of Immigrant Affairs for the state of Maryland to address our immigration issues. In terms of health care, um, additionally, in terms of health care, we would really like uh, for um, the, the um, delegation and for the Senate to continue trying to um, pass the uh, universal health care. We are, we really think uh, Maryland could uh, be a great state to um, implement universal health care. I think a study is really needed in order for us to um, do that implementation. We're also um, very interested in police reform and would support the bills uh, regarding repealing the officer's bill of rights, uh, use of force, uh, we, we would support prohibiting schools from having police and control of the police back to Baltimore City. So those are just some of the areas that we're interested in and we really 
would also want you to commit to overriding the veto for the blue schools, the blueprint for the schools. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Appreciate you joining us. Next, I have Shay Savoy. You mentioned she wanted to speak. We'll go ahead and unmute you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shay Savoy, and I am a teacher at Woodlawn High School. I'm a very proud educator, and I'm here to, um, to talk about justice in our schools, not just in terms of the big picture forward momentum with um, the blueprint, but also the immediate threat that my school community in particular is facing. Um, as a member of the Woodlawn community, I want to talk about how our community has been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. So when the coronavirus reached Baltimore County, it burrowed its spiky head deep into our zip code where our school is, 1207. And as we all know, it has not let up and it's picking up steam. And tonight, all of these months later, when I looked at the county map that showed the concentration of COVID cases, it is still, uh, Woodlawn, my school is still smack dab right in the middle of the deepest red. Um, and what I can tell you as an educator who has been using online learning over these past few months is that real connections are being made and it's not ideal but um, there is learning happening, there is connection happening, and what would happen if we were forced to return to school buildings before it is safe to do so? Um, it's not worth the risk. The level of death and the way that our, our community would be impacted is not worth the risk. And I can tell you as a teacher, Woodlawn has about 1,600 students, and we have over 200 staff members, and the idea of trying to pack into that building and try to maintain six feet of social distancing without proper ventilation, to try to manage all of the health protocols, to be in classrooms and not even be able to benefit from what we get from in-person learning, such as uh, collaborative group work, um, being able to move around the classroom, being able to teach in a meaningful way, all of that would be lost paired with the high anxiety, um, the stress, and the death that would inevitably ensue. And not just with our students, with our staff and with the communities that would be disproportionately impacted by the disease. Because our community has a lot of frontline essential workers who are in the line of fire every day. Our community has been impacted by systemic racism that has resulted in lack of access to adequate housing and adequate resources and adequate health care. So when we talk about getting our kids back in school, we need to talk about our kids and our school communities as whole people. So I, um, I just want to say that in this forum because I know some other things um, have been said and I, as a Teacher of the Year nominee, um, I know what I'm talking about as an educator. I know how things are going in our schools, and we need to put health and safety first. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Thanks so much for joining us, Shay. Appreciate the work that you do. Next, I have Kristen Nielsen on my list. We'll go ahead and unmute you if you're still here. Thank you. Hi, I am still here. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. I was Baltimore County's Teacher of the Year last year, and I'm proud to be a teacher at Crossroads Center. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to speak on a few different issues today. One is to help our, our Maryland families in any way that you can with financial support. I have students who cannot come to my classes because they are working for their families. Um, so anything that could be done would be helpful. In terms of Kerwin, overriding the veto is critical because we need the concentration of poverty grants. My school went from four social workers to less than one. And I had a student in crisis and I, I had to personally sit in, the, sit in the hallway with a student and another student because we did not have a social worker in the building. 
so we've got to have those we've got to have the money we need the sel help that we do not have right now i was actually meeting with a senior this morning to try to brainstorm some mental health ideas that we can do right now in virtual learning so we're doing the best that we can with what we have and we're making it work but we need more and our students deserve more in regard to COVID with what Shay said, one of my sophomores was hospitalized with COVID. She found out that Friday in the hospital, she lost three family members, her grandmother, her aunt, and her sister. And she's now having to care for her siblings after having survived COVID. She already lost her parents. So our students have endured so much trauma. They can't just go back to school reopen Baltimore, they're following the advice of Oster, who's an economist. We can't be following the advice of an economist to reopen our schools. One of my students lost her mother last week to COVID, suddenly. She still hasn't been back to school. The, the trauma that our students facing is real and we, we can't just wipe it away, that we are doing everything that we can. I was planning until 10 o'clock last night because I want to do what I can for my students in terms of social emotional, in terms of creating lessons, in terms of kind of balancing the needs that they have with this platform that's safe. One of my students stayed on with me at lunch to share that she actually likes it because she's on time. She doesn't have to wait at the bus stop. She feels safe at home. She doesn't feel as distracted. So we really are making the best of this situation. It's not ideal, but it's a pandemic. It's not ideal. We're not living in an ideal world, but anything that you can do to make the best of the resources that we have and to provide us with the resources that we need is so important right now. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Next, I have <clears throat> Lloyd Allen requested to speak. I see you down there, Lloyd. Can we un, there we go. We're, we're fighting over my mute button. I apologize. My name is Lloyd Allen. Uh, I'm also a teacher with Baltimore County Public Schools and I thank you for your time. Uh, it goes without saying that I too look forward to uh, Kerwin uh, and the associated legislation's veto being overturned. Um, but uh, when we're talking about reopening schools, it's really important that we look at the CDC guidance as to when reopening the schools and by reopening, I mean physically opening uh, the schools uh, should happen. We have been open. We've been open pretty continuously, except for stuff that's not related to COVID. Uh, but the CDC has thresholds based on the number of cases per 100,000 uh, persons within the last 14 days. Um, and this is where we are right now. Uh, we are worse than we were in the middle of the summer. Uh, and that looks like a plateau that doesn't look like it's coming down again. Uh, so when we get back to the yellow, uh, then it would be appropriate for us to consider bringing back small populations. When we get back to the green, it's absolutely appropriate for us to be in school buildings. But right now, I don't want my kids to take COVID home to their caretakers, especially when some of the students have caretakers who are the only person left in their family to care for them. Uh, so that means that when we're down to 12 cases a day, uh, we'll be in good shape. So if everybody does their part, if everybody wears masks, if everybody stays home, if everybody stays with their core nuclear family for holidays, then the schools can open. But if people are going to go out to bars and if people are going to visit their external family, then we're not going to be able to physically return to the school buildings. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, I will mention I have one more person that we identified from the chat and from the participants that indicated they'd like to speak. We are still, we still have time. If there's anybody else, please let us know and we'll keep going. Christopher Dews, you're up. Well, thank you. I'm assuming you all can hear me. Yes, sir. You're yeah. good. Fantastic. My name is Christopher Dews. I'm a policy advocate for the Job Opportunities Task Force. Our mission is simply to help low wage workers advance to higher wage jobs. And so we just want you guys to consider a few pieces of legislation that are gonna be uh, in Annapolis this session. 
First and foremost is the veto overrides. I know it's already been mentioned uh, for some of these bills, but the veto override for the unit rule, which is going to allow for increased and expansive ex uh, criminal record expungement, as well as the Women's Pre-Release Center, which is going to allow uh, a, a robust amount of reentry services for those uh, women who are incarcerated within the state. We also want you to consider another expungement bill. We are pushing a bill this session for automatic expungement of non-convictions. These are convictions, uh, not even convictions really, but these are uh, measures that are left on somebody's record that are that resulted in a, con um, goodness, my brain today, uh, acquittals, dismissals, or no processes. These shouldn't get in the way since a person was technically not found guilty. They shouldn't get in the way of a person's life. We're also looking to reform the pretrial justice system through GPS, uh, making sure that poor people who cannot afford to pay for GPS monitoring do not have to pay for GPS monitoring. That's home detention or being put on the box. We're considering a piece of legislation there as well. We're also looking to push for diminution credits for incarcerated citizens, for those who get themselves educated while they're inside. We want a slight reduction of sentencing. So that's a dim credits bill that's going to come across uh, your desks, as well as an auto insurance bill to try to remove credit history uh, from being in use uh, for the underwriting of auto insurance purposes. And the reason why we want to do that is because it's going to sharply lower the cost for those in Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and PG County. I'm pretty sure this county has to say to be a little more professional. So those are some of the bills we're looking at. We also are looking to expand the Maryland Healthy Working Families Act to ensure that uh, some of the provisions that are in the governor's executive orders actually make it into the law so that way we have some public health emergency provisions because currently we do not. And last but not least, we are pushing to remove a lot of criminal justice fines and fees. We find it to be incredibly unfair that a vast majority of indigenous populations throughout the state of Maryland find themselves in robust amounts of criminal justice debt simply for having interactions with the criminal justice system. And this is everything from parole and probation fees, home detention, expungement fees, all these other different things from jury costs. And so we're looking at a lot of different things this session. We just hope that you guys will consider uh, pushing our legislation or, or, or supporting our legislation as we push to make life a lot better for the low wage workers in the state of Maryland. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Christopher. All right. Anyone else? Do we have any of the participants that'd like to address the delegation while you're here? And um, Cole, I'm going to rely on you to keep looking for hands going up. Just checking the yeah, chat. Yeah, absolutely. If, if anybody would like to speak, go ahead and uh, use the raise your hand chat function or um, send, a, send a message in the chat and I will, uh, I'll get to you. And I'll say that we've, in the past, <clears throat> when we've done this in person, we've gone for about two hours and um, we we're not at the two hour mark yet, uh, but we are very close. Uh, we didn't end early last time as well, but we've had everybody who indicated they'd like to speak. If there are folks watching on Facebook that weren't able to get into the chat, um, apologize, but please send us uh, your questions. If you've already sent them to us, we do have them and we'll uh, respond in kind after the zoom. Um, and thank you for your patience as we, all figure out how to do this. This is actually, for those who are paying attention too, we've stayed, we've dropped off towards the end here, but we stayed well over a hundred participants and we stayed around 25 to 35 people watching on Facebook. I want you all to know that this is a good um, uh, dry run for the session. Our delegation meetings and are going to be taking place every Friday as they normally would, except it's going to be virtual. So the delegation members will be on the Zoom call. Uh, depending on what the topic is and what we're discussing, we'll have participants that will be let into the Zoom, but you all will be able to participate and watch through YouTube. And now that you've engaged with us through this town hall, uh, and we've captured information from the past town halls, we will be letting you all know uh, how you can engage with us during the legislative session as well, because uh, you are the important piece of this puzzle. Uh, we cannot do our work appropriately uh, or effectively without hearing from you. Uh, and this is why we implemented these uh, these town halls. Some other counties have done it for a while, and we started doing because we knew the importance of engaging with you, and that you know that you have a way to engage with us and feel that you're part of the process. Because a lot of folks feel disengaged, we want to get rid of that that feeling. And the only way we can do that is by providing as many opportunities to engage with us as possible. Um, I, for those who've been participating, you see we've issues of COVID-19, public health, public education, about overcrowding, special education needs, the blueprint legislation, uh, veto overrides. We are a diverse county. Uh, we have urban, suburban, uh, rural. We go all the way up to Pennsylvania. 
Um, and I think those issues have been uh, highlighted tonight by the folks that were willing to speak and by the folks who just reached out to us with questions about what they are expecting from us during the legislative session. Um, I don't see anyone else um, asking to say anything. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end it early again. Oh, Doug, yeah. you have two hands. Oh, you oh, had I do, two we hands do. earlier. Did I? You did. I believe they lowered them. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, Diana Bergman and no. Linda Dorsey Walker both wanted to say something. Gotcha. Well, we're going to... We, we let everybody have a bite of the apple and we're going to come up on two hours here at the moment, but we appreciate everybody participating. If there's something that we missed, please reach out to, the, to our offices. We'll be sure to reach out. Uh, as I said before, some folks in the beginning too had specific questions. We wanted to make sure that we had enough time for folks to engage, which we came right up to our two hour mark. Um, but please reach back out to us. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the members for the work that they do and taking time tonight to engage with the constituents and citizens of Baltimore County. Uh, have a happy holiday. And we're looking forward to seeing you and working with you while we're in the legislative session. Thank you all very much.